And it is interesting too uh, to to see what you noted there that uh, you know we obviously on this show we talk a lot about the Supreme Court and how it views the Second Amendment, and that's been an especially hot topic since Bruin was handed down last year for obvious reasons. But uh, the other noticeable trend from the court is that they are very skeptical of agency overreach, and um, so these cases and we're. As we're filming this, we're still waiting for the Supreme Court to hand down its decision on whether or not it's going to intervene on an emergency basis in the ghost gun case. Uh, we don't have that news yet. Uh, we hopefully will by the time we get to our news update when we film that later today. But because um, we're filming on Friday here, but uh, you know, it, it it seems like these cases all have a a really good chance of of standing up. These the the, the reasonings used by these judges in the Fifth Circuit if they do end up at the Supreme Court. Do you think that's accurate? I think that's accurate, especially since last year, because there's been two developments in our jurisprudence over the last three years, both of them salutary for advocates of the right to keep and bear arms. One of them, as you say, is that the Supreme Court has become less and less tolerant of executive overreach. And you've seen this with the growth of the major questions doctrine and uh, of a, a stickler approach to the Administrative Procedure Act. And then on the Second Amendment, we've seen Bruin. Bruin has changed the game in ways that are not yet completely obvious, but it raised the bar that Heller had left quite low. And one of the problems with Heller was that there was no standard of review. Uh, the instructions contained no real analytical framework for lower courts to use. And as a result, many lower courts simply continued as if Heller had never happened after McDonald had incorporated it to the states. Bruin, uh, with a, a conscious and explicit admonition from Clarence Thomas, ended that practice. Uh, and it instituted a comprehensible standard, which is the existence of a historical analog. Um, it made it clear the Second Amendment's not a second-class right, uh, and it instructed uh, the lower courts to um, adhere to its guidelines instead of ignoring them. Um, so you've now got uh, lower courts that are aware that the Supreme Court is unlikely to tolerate executive branch shenanigans and uh, that the Supreme Court is serious about enforcing the Second Amendment. And I think those two things in concert have made it a much better environment for those of us who think that the Second Amendment deserves to be upheld in the same way as would any other part of the Constitution.